This is uh, Pramit from High End Films, and uh, my question to both is: is that you are telling a very funny and heartfelt story about friendship, and you are also commenting on the prevalent nature of racism in the twenty first century. So, how do you find? How did you find the balance between the two and ensure that both of those aspects are equally hearted? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, as director, I uh, really I focus on the friendship between the two uh, young men, the uh, Sean and Kunle, and uh, keeping that honest and grounded. As this is this is real stakes for them. Uh, there's humor coming from how they are uh, trying to figure out what to do and the different worldviews that they have about how to to, to handle the situation. Um, and because it's grounded in like real stakes for them, um, it's, uh, it's funny, but it's not like making light of the situation. So, yeah. um, that was, that was really like my North star and like making sure this film didn't fall too much into like broad comedy or go to, you know, the other way of like being too serious. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and Katie, you know, wrote really really great scenarios and 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 set pieces where they could have these debates that would reveal character and be funny yeah i think from the writing side it's really important to understand the themes and that are driving the story and the tone like because we were dealing with something that's tonally a tightrope walk between comedy and thriller slash horror um i guess thriller elements is um like understanding that where the comedy comes from is this, it's this, the theme is like about the, the burden that people of color in America have of having to think about how you're being perceived at all times. And to have that like awareness of like, what image am I projecting right now? And the management of that. And especially when you're, if you're, if you're, if you're in an emergency situation, the question of am I more afraid of the emergency that's in front of me or of calling 911 and you know we're poking fun at the absurdity that that's even a question that needs to be asked at all and you know so it, it operates on the level of comedy because we're poking fun at that absurdity but it also because the stakes are so high the same question is driving the thriller element so I think that like for for balancing it's it's making sure that we know where the where the humor is coming from mm -hmm. and knowing that like keeping it grounded in the relationships and those and and those keeping those stakes is you know it, it's gonna it's not yeah. gonna lessen the humor to to not lean or to like we don't want to avoid uh the the darkness mm. you know it's like we gotta we gotta be honest about this yeah. because i think the thing that makes it cathartic to watch is that i mean i i hope i guess is that um we're 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 hitting on something that is true for so many people. And, you know, we're, we're trying to present that in a way that's not going to just shy away from it or like, yeah. It, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. She's, she's alive. We should call 911. Hey, stop. Are you crazy? We didn't do hey, anything hey, wrong. We don't have to do nothing wrong. Cool night. The cops are not going to listen. They just go come in here and see three brown guys hanging over this little white girl. So, so talking about uh, themes that uh, reveal, uh, the, uh, talking about scenes that reveal themes. So the whole conversation in the forest. So I, I, it seems like an encapsulation of the real issue, which is like uh, a situation created by white privilege uh, is leading to these people of color just tearing themselves apart and going in different directions. So was that the intention or just a result of the character drama that's in so? I mean, in, in some ways... Yes, the the kind of the really overarching villain of the movie is not necessarily a particular person, you know, like ev everyone in the film is well intentioned, like, you know, like everybody thinks that they're like even, you know, the, the antagonists of the film, you know, Maddie and, um, and Alice, like, you know, Maddie, primarily the antagonist, like she feels completely justified in like all of her actions as she's going forward. She doesn't have this feeling like, you know, she's she's going forward and kind of making the situation worse for, for our heroes. Uh, the, the, the kind of, the situation is, the real villain is systemic racism is the real villain mm. of the movie. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the biases that she has, she's not even aware of. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a framework where she can justify her actions and like 
everyone along the way can justify their actions because they're reacting to this overarching just specter of this this overarching culture of fear that that you know people of color have against the police it's like that's hanging over the entire film it's it's funny because it's like if it, a lot of it is it's so american in a lot of ways like we're we're telling a story that's very much about this this moment that we're living in and i mean i guess it's a moment that we've been living in for way too long now and the idea that it hasn't gone away we can't just leave her somewhere we take her to the hospital shotgun We should just call 911. But you're It looks like she's in that car. What the hell is going on? We don't know who she is. Actually, she just told me that she's in high school. No! The first question that I wanted to ask is that the chemistry between the three of you is so impeccable that it doesn't even feel like you are reading the lines of a script. So, how much of that was like improv or rehearsal? Or was that how conversation your characters were in the script? I feel like they saw us just being professionals. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Damn. No, I'm playing. It was, it was a mixture of both. The script was so good that you didn't have to reach far. Yeah. Um, but also we were allotted so much time right. of the, the the thing of improv, you know. So if there was very somewhere, encouraged. Yeah, that. very encouraged to do what we felt. Like mm. is Carlos feeling that? No, he's not. He's actually feeling this. Yeah. Do it, you know. Yeah. Um, that that freedom is always good. Yeah, you know, there were, we, at some point we developed an awareness of like, yeah, we're gonna start riffing. We're gonna have a little bit of fun with it. Um, and there were some scenes where Carrie would be like, "Hey, if you want to just say a little something, like you know, get like you have a little line in here, a little this that." Mm-hmm. And like, honestly, I feel like I'm too uh, horrified right now. Like, I, I don't think I can <laughs> yeah, speak yeah, yeah. very well. <laughs> um, and it was always a conversation. We're always just kind of finding it, figuring it out, you know. Right. And we did a, a thing, it felt more like theater because we rehearsed for like a week before we shot and you don't always get that luxury. Right. Um, and so it was nice to kind of not just have to jump in, but I think we probably could have like jumped in on the first day and then, yeah. you know, just we get the bones things, up, but, but, right? Yeah, but like, yeah, feel each other's energy and, you know, it feels way more authentic when you put it in front of the camera, so. Mm-hmm. And one of the most haunting things about the movie is the epilogue with the party and uh, Maddie's apology and uh, Kunle's final look into the camera. So mm-hmm. I kind of wanted to understand that what are your interpretations of that epilogue? Uh, it's a loss of innocence for me. It's a big time loss of innocence. And no matter what words are being given, whether you pay for the floor, there's no amount of money that can get that back. Um, there's no words that you can say that can get that back. It's okay. Um, it's fine. I'd rather just move on. And he's not going, he'll never be the same from this. And that's really kind of heartbreaking. Um, but it's a necessary thing in order to, you know, in order to go about life. So, yeah. And, and I think, you know, when we were on set shooting that sequence, you know, we're all looking at Don, like trying to make sure that he's okay. You know, Kunle, you know, that we're, it, 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 we all recognize that moment. It's not necessarily private. You see him deal with it. And like, yeah. we really see him deal with it. Yeah. It was uh-huh. just, it was a freaky day for me too. Like I, I, I only wanted to check and see how he was, but I knew if I checked on him, I would take him out of his, you know, mental space right. and right. him being alone, you feel me, without Sean was what he needed. But just knowing the weight of the scene, but then also knowing Donald needed to be in his headphones, right. you know, that day. So, so much of his, happy space he had done depleted himself and deprived himself of so it was like dang bro so and then just hearing like the outcome and then being able to see it it was like and i think yeah. sometimes like, i just want to go back and fight everybody on the street <laughs> i think sometimes sharing the the painful difficult thing and actually talking about it with another actor with the director or something that kind of takes the power away from it right yeah, it's, it's yeah. just your secret is your thing that you're dealing with yeah. otherwise you know yeah yeah and it's tough that was hard to do because we're literally uh looking at a fucking camera well well yeah but but we're playing like with the cake and stuff yeah. or we're like having a chance to say oh he did it he's yeah. there but then there's always that haunting thing when you least expect it that's how trauma works right. yeah you know yeah. so i'm triggered i'm triggered right <laughs> that's all the time i have and uh i wish you the best for the movie you have done all really well thank you man thank you thank, thank you thank you, thank you.